I'm not sure even if this is recording, so I'm going to look. It is recording. So yeah, I made a video earlier this evening and I made it in my main study and now I'm sitting in our dining room. And when I made that earlier video, it was, it was like 5 after 8 o'clock. Now it's 9.05 at night. It is on the September the 28th. 2016 it's a Wednesday my wife's at work she couldn't sleep this afternoon I don't know how she's gonna stay awake but my wife has great endurance she got up early and she went to women's Bible study before she went to work but I don't know if she can keep doing that Unfortunately, women's Bible study doesn't take in consideration women who work night shifts. My wife's a night nurse and she works from 8 at night until 8 in the morning. And she doesn't get home and really until about 9 o'clock in the morning. 12 hour shifts. And most women have their Bible studies in the morning at church. And... Uh, and on the evenings, my wife goes to work. She likes to be involved in her church, but uh, time-wise, it's kind of difficult. Unfortunately, people in the church don't take consideration that. So, what can she do? So, I was going to... So, tonight, I really can't get into my other books, my uh, secular books. It was kind of interesting. I came across the other night the word... Secular means sublunar. <laughs> I don't know what, why secular and d his derived from the word sublunar. That's kind of interesting. I was going to check that out on the internet. But uh, I do feel like reading this book tonight. Uh, I was reading it earlier this evening. I don't know what it is. Uh, today I, I feel kind of depressed as I've mentioned I do suffer from bouts of depression uh, I have my good days good spells and bad spells and today I I felt kind of kind of depressed I don't know why well I have some what's the word I I can guess but it's really weird. You can wake up one day and you feel really good inside. Or I used to tell people either I'm super depressed or I am mildly depressed. <laughs> so I don't know. Sometimes I wonder if I'm always depressed and I just don't know it. But I, anyway, I, I was feeling kind of kind of depressed I suppose and I don't know why my wife says it's the change of seasons we're entering October the light changes the air temperature the leaves start falling from the trees and the days get darker and longer and you have dreary days but we do have here in West Michigan really beautiful fall days, sunny and warm, and everything turns golden brown, and it's really pretty. And then it gets, everything just turns brown, and everything just dies, and the trees become bare. And then winter comes. Usually winter comes around the end of November, sometimes just before Thanksgiving, sometimes it'll snow here. So we have October and November. And before you know it, yeah, winter's going to be here. So tonight, uh, I was thinking of, usually I was going to go down in the lower level. As I mentioned, I have my laptop down there. I have a laptop down there in the lower level. And that's where I type out quotes from books into my diary, my online diary. But... I thought instead I would just read this from this book, God Has Spoken in His Son, A Biblical Theology of Hebrews by Peter T. O'Brien. 
I've noticed that in book two, people will read Shakespeare's sonnets, they'll read from The Hobbit, they'll read poetry, they'll read all kinds of things. And so I thought, why can't I read from a book that I th really enjoy reading? I've, I'm getting kind of blessed in reading this book. Why do I get blessed? Because it's setting forth the gospel. It's setting forth biblical truth, eternal realities. And I really like this section here where Peter O'Brien discusses the atonement, the death of Christ, as it's presented in the letter to the Hebrews, which is found in the New Testament, which is found in the Holy Bible. As I mentioned, you go through the New Testament. As you come in, you have Hebrews. Hebrews. Hebrews, you have Titus before you have second. First, Second Timothy, Titus, and then you have Philemon, and then you have a letter to the Hebrews. And so in this book, he's discussing how salvation, or how the death of Christ, the atonement, is set forth. And he says here, Since the dominant view of the human plight in Hebrews is the great gulf between a holy God and an, an unholy humanity caused by sin and guilt. As I have shown in the preceding chapter, the most widespread imagery used by the author for the mighty divine rescue is drawn from the Old Testament sacrificial system, with Christ's death presented as a sacrifice of atonement in a significance expounded in terms of the Day of Atonement ritual. The first reference in Hebrews to the work, the saving work of Christ, is described of cleansing, the purification of sins. And he's quoting from Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, who being the brightness of his glory and express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Purification is one of the author's major concerns to which he returns again and again. In his incarnation, Jesus, the transcendent Son of God, became fully human, yet without sin, so as to become a, become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, that he might make atonement for the sins of his people. And he quotes here 2.17, Wherefore, in all things it behoove him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people, for in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. Atonement has to do with a restoration of the relationship marred by sin, and this encompasses both expiation, sin's removal, and propitiation, the averting of divine wrath. The Old Testament viewed atonement as involving propitiation, the dealing with sin in order to avert the wrath of God. Look at Numbers, Book of Numbers, chapter 16, verse 46, and often mentions the sin for which the persons for whom atonement is made. Hebrews assumes the biblical doctrine that atonement is necessary because sin is an offense that separates people from God and secures and cures his wrath. Uh, it says, For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression disobedience has received a just recompense of reward. God punishes sin. Uh, and it goes down here, it says, Hebrews assumes the biblical doctrine of atonement is necessary because sin is an offense that separates people from God and cures his wrath. God's holy anger is emphasized in the letter, see, for, see Hebrews chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 3. And the listeners are warned of it, just as Moses' generation had been. 
look at, for example, Hebrews 3, 7 through chapter 4, verse 13. Christ's death was a propitiatory, for he took upon himself the covenant curse on those who were disobedient. Hebrews 9, verses 16 through 22. By the single sufficient sacrifice of himself, he not only set aside sin and finally settled the sin problem for all history, thereby bringing the ages to the divine intended climax, the cultivation of the ages. Hebrews 9, verse 26. He also purified his people. Hebrews 11, Hebrews 1, verse 3. Hebrews 9, 13 and 14. Delivering men and women from God's fiery judgment. Hebrews 10, verse 26 to 31. Hebrews 12, verse 29. For wrath is now averted. He no longer remembers the sins of his people. Hebrews 10, 11 through 15. We'll read that passage. It says in Hebrews 10, 11 through 15. And every priest stand of daily ministering and offering sometimes the second, same sacrifice which could never take away sins. But this man, Jesus Christ, has he offered, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down in the right hand of God, for henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. Therefore the Holy Ghost also is a witness for us, for after that he had been said before. Christ offered himself unblemished to God, 9 verse 14, as the sinless high priest was able to make final sacrifice, Hebrews 7 27, that explains how Jesus made purification or atonement for the sins of his people. This forgiveness of sins was promised by God under the new covenant and guaranteed by the perfect high priest who offered for all time one sacrifice for sins after which he sat down at the right hand of God indicating his work was finished. Verse 10, verse 12, For this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. The purification or of or atonement for sins is also described as a definite cleansing of human conscience from the attitudes and practices that belong to this way of death. Hebrews 9 verse 14, Hebrews 10 verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our, heart, our bodies washed with pure water. Hebrews 10 verse 12. The purification or atonement of sins is described as a definite cleansing of human conscience from the attitudes and practices that belong to the way of death. Hebrews understands that sin affects all people and every person's conscience is tainted. And emancipation to be em, is it emancipated, <laughs> that's a word, it's like emancipated, emancipated, from this dreadful bondage, men and women can now serve and worship the living God. The purpose for which they have been created, since the forgiveness of sins, for, for since the forgiveness God's Son has won is, is permanent, and the barrier between God and humanity has been removed, men and women can now enter the presence of God with confidence and receive mercy and grace in their time of need. See Hebrews 4, verse 16, for example. For whom they had heard... Oh, wait a minute. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Verse 7, uh, chapter 7, verse 19 says... For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by which we draw nigh unto God. Verse 25, Wherefore he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. We draw near to God now with the directness and certainty that belongs to the final state of his people. The language of drawing near to God is thus used by the author to speak of the privileged one by Christ for the new covenant people. 
Christ's once for all sacrificial death results not only in purification, expiration of sins, and thus the cleansing of people's consciences, it also achieves sanctification and perfection. There is a close relationship between cleansing from sin, sanctification, and perfection, though they are not synonymous. The sanctification of God's people was the goal of Christ fulfilling the Father's will by offering himself as a sacrifice for sins. Hebrews 10, verse 10, by which he will sanctify through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. The designation of believers as already sanctified is consistent with the stress on sanctification as something that has already been won for us by the blood of Christ. So the description, we have been made holy, Hebrews 10, verse 10, signifies a definitive consecration to God through the effective cleansing from sin that qualifies us for fellowship with Him. Further, the notion of believer's perfection, which has been achieved through Christ being made perfect, emphasizes both the realized aspect of salvation as well as the permanent effects for believers. The context of Hebrews 10 verse 14, which says, For by one offering He has perfected forever, then they are sanctified, lost my place here. Uh, at the same time, perfection is used to proclaim the fulfillment or the consummation of men and women in the permanent, direct, and personal relationship to God. Christ's death secures for believers a share in the future that God has promised. The perfection of believers involves all of this. So perfection in language is used of the complete realization at the final fulfillment of all God's promises an unfolding of what is in principle even now achieved through Christ's sacrifice. Moreover, the outcome of this definitive cleansing, sanctification, perfection is the privilege of entering the presence of God with confidence now and anticipation of our final entry into the most holy place forever. So that's good news. That through the death of Christ, through his sacrificial death, we now can enter into the very presence of God now, and then the final entry into the most holy place forever, which will be the new creation, which is called heaven. So I thought that was really good and kind of blessed me and I just wanted to share it in this video. And because, it, you know, I really, since I don't go to church, it's really a blessing to hear some good, solid, biblical gospel preaching. And I found this in this book that I've been reading from my devotions. So that's why I want to share tonight. Until next time, bye.